welcome everyone. Thank you to my guests for joining me this special Halloween episode, and thanks to Jay Nightmares for translating some of these stories from Japanese. I hope you're ready for this. I don't even know where to start. I guess I'll just write it all in chronological order from when I heard other people's stories and then experienced whatever it was for myself. To preface this, I should mention that all of this took place back home on my reservation. Another thing I should mention is that, on the res, traditional beliefs and legends of the paranormal are still a big part of our community. The attitude of most people towards the paranormal is one of assurance. To us, the paranormal is a regular part of life. We believe in a spirit world, and we believe that sometimes these beings can cross over into our world and maybe even live among us. When I tell paranormal stories to my non-native friends, they are always in such disbelief that things like this have actually happened, and how casually I talk about it, but it's only because it's been so normalized for me. Where they have absolutely no paranormal experiences, I have a bunch, and most of everyone I know on the res has even more than I do. I don't really care to explain it. Maybe we're all crazy from drinking our toxic tap water. I don't know. Anyway, here's the story. This all happened in the fall of 2011. I was 16 years old. I was living in a nearby city with my mom so that I could get a better education than the one I could get back home. But we'd go back every single weekend to see my dad and little brother. One Friday, during the drive back home, I got a text from a friend of mine. She told me about a party that was happening that night and asked me when I'd be home so they could pick me up. I gave her a time and that was that. We get home and as soon as we stepped inside the house, we see my dad and my cousin sitting at the kitchen table drinking some beers. They're both cops on the res, so usually beers with his partner on a Friday evening means that they've had a particularly tough week at work. Typically, the toughest cases to deal with are the child abuse ones, so a part of me felt sad immediately that something bad had happened. They both look tired and drained, but they're happy to see us. We say our greetings, catch up a bit, and my dad asks me if I have plans. I tell him about the party and where it'll be, and he and our cousins share a weird look. Why are you guys making that face? Did something happen? I ask. I don't know. Should we tell her? My cousin said, looking at my dad. He laughed, and they decided that I should probably know what's been going on, since I'd be going to a cottage pretty deep in the woods later that evening. They start with the first strange call they got on Monday night. An older woman called, saying that people were outside of her house, knocking on all of her windows. She said she couldn't see anybody, but there must have been at least three people, judging by all the different locations of the knocking. They arrived at the woman's home, inspected all around the house, even checked the woods, but nothing came up. They tell her it's probably just some teenagers playing tricks on her, and that there isn't much else they can do besides patrol around the area in case they come back. On Wednesday night, the same woman called again with the same problem. It had rained that day, and there was mud all around this woman's home, so they figured that at the very least, they'd find footprints, but they couldn't find a thing. This is when they started feeling like something was off, because one of the windows where the woman was adamant about their being knocking was completely impossible to get to without stepping through this huge mud puddle. This is when they started to think that the woman was lying, but they just told her the same thing they told her a few nights prior. By Thursday night, everyone on the res had been talking about these strange experiences. It turns out, this woman wasn't the only one experiencing the knocking. She was just the only one to call the police. I mean, all of this was taking place on a res, so it wasn't long before people were linking it to supernatural causes. My dad was still sure it was just a bunch of teenagers pranking people, but then they got another call from the same woman for the same reason. They rushed over and were met with the same situation, except this time, the neighbor walked over looking pale as a ghost. He says, Is this about the knocking? 
They notice he's a little shaky. Yeah, did you see something? They asked him. The man nodded and said, You guys are gonna think I'm crazy, but yeah. And he goes on to explain what he saw. He said that he stepped outside for a cigarette on his front porch when he heard knocking. He looked around to see where it was coming from, and when he looked at his neighbor's house, he saw it. There was a black figure standing outside the woman's window, looking into her home. He said that it looked humanoid in stature, but completely made out of a shadow. You could tell it was something solidish, but you couldn't make out any features on it. He stared at it, completely in shock and watched the thing as it knocked a couple of times and then darted around the house, knocking on every single window. He said it moved too fast to be human. It was practically a blur. It went around the house a few times, then ran across the road into the tree line, behind one tree in particular. The man was frozen, but he couldn't look away. It then leaned out from behind the tree staring directly at him with yellow eyes that reflected the light similarly to a cat's. And then it smiled, showing its small but numerous pointed and sharp teeth. I almost shit my pants. He had attempted to joke, but his voice was still shaking. Fast forward to Friday. Stories are being exchanged all over the res about other sightings and experiences people were having. On top of multiple people experiencing the knocking, there were also quite a few sightings with everyone describing the creature in the same way. One woman was bringing her trash bin to the road when she thought she saw someone in her peripheral vision standing near the trees. She walked back up the driveway and into her home, feeling like she was being watched. Right before she was about to open her door to go back inside her home, she looked back and saw two reflective yellow eyes watching her from the trees. She said it was about five feet above the ground. Another couple was driving at night, and they saw a humanoid figure standing in the middle of the road. As they got closer, they slowed down, and it turned around to face them. That's when they saw the reflective yellow eyes and the sharp, pointed teeth as it smiled at them. They stopped the car, too afraid to go closer to it, until they decided to just drive past it. Being on a narrow road, they drove past it with the figure being only a few feet from the window, staring at them the whole time. You still sure you want to go to that party? My dad asks, but my friends were already pulling into the driveway. I gave my family hugs and kisses goodbye and they told me to be careful, but I felt fine. The common belief among native people is that negative energy attracts negative energy. Therefore, an evil spirit would be drawn to people with unresolved issues, traumas, and sinners, I suppose. If you're someone who's spiritual, self-aware, and basically a good person, that, in and of itself, will be protective. I get to the party and within 20 minutes, the conversation shifts towards all the paranormal experiences people have been having. I'm really curious about what everyone has to say because they have stories I haven't heard yet. But my friend couldn't hold her alcohol very well and was crying about how she wishes she was closer with her brother. I was trying to make her feel better while listening to everyone's stories. One of the people at the party was related to the neighbor of the woman who was calling the police. The experience really shook him up, and my friend was just explaining everything that he was doing later on. For one, he smudged his entire home, which is something our people do when we're looking for extra protection against paranormal entities. He also went to visit multiple elders around the community, asking for advice and any information they had on similar happenings. What we do know about paranormal experiences on the res is that they don't happen as often as they used to. If you talk to one of our elders, they have endless stories and even more advice to give about how to protect yourself compared to now. One of the explanations that was given to this guy about the shadow thing was that it was evidence that someone was doing an unauthorized shaking tent ceremony. If you don't know what that is, you can look it up but it's basically like a Ouija board session that takes place inside a tent of some sort. People standing around the tent, 
while the medicine man or medicine woman goes inside and asks questions. The tent begins to shake, and you can hear the voices of spirits coming through. I've never personally been to one, because we haven't had good enough reason to make one, but typically our ancestors used shaking tent ceremonies while they were starving in the dead of winter and needed some direction on where the nearest food source was. My mom's been to one, and her story is absolutely crazy. She described multiple voices of men and women, only speaking a native tongue, and they were upset that the people were doing a shaking tent ceremony when they weren't on the verge of death. The people there had to explain that they were only doing the ceremony to prove to people that it was real, as we'd been losing our culture as a result of residential schools. But the spirits were angry about this, saying that the bridge between the two worlds should never be opened unless absolutely necessary, because you do not know who you're communicating with. It could be evil spirits, and it could be good ones. It could be ancestors, but you never know. Anyways, the elders told him that the spirits crossed over into our world because of a shaking tent ceremony. Someone on the reserve has been doing them without consultation of the elders. So we started thinking about who would do that, without proper guidance and without good enough reason to do so. Then two of the drunkest guys at this point start saying shit like, uh, I'm not scared, that thing could show up now and it couldn't do shit basically egging it on. All of us were looking at each other like, why the fuck would you disrespect an evil spirit? That's exactly how you attract it to you. And that's when I decided to leave the sunroom where everyone was hanging out. I went to the living room to console my drunk, crying friend, when I noticed that the rocking chair outside on the porch was going back and forth. I looked away immediately, refusing to make direct eye contact but I did look at it from my peripheral vision. I'm inside the cottage, and I keep seeing this rocking chair going back and forth and back and forth, but another thing we're raised to do in our culture is to ignore paranormal experiences. Spirits feed on the energy that people put towards them, so if you freak out, if you get angry, if you yell at it or start crying, that's exactly what it wants, and it will stick around once it gets a reaction. It thrives on energy of any kind. So while I knew something fucked up was happening on the rocking chair, I wasn't about to pay it any attention. Five minutes or so goes by, and I'm still seeing it moving in the corner of my eye. That's when my friend screams, and she runs to the other side of the sunroom. My other friend sprints to where the girl was sitting and busts through the French doors onto the balcony. All of this happens in a split second but I immediately go to the patio and ask what's going on. My friend is crying on the couch with friends all around her. She claims to have seen the spirit. She said she was listening to the boys talk about the spirit when she saw one of their faces as he was looking out onto the balcony behind her. She turned around to see what he was looking at, and directly on the other side of the window was the shadow spirit sitting on the rocking chair, smiling at her literally three feet from her. That's when the boy sprinted towards it and bust through the French doors. I walk outside to find the boy and he's on the lawn, staring into the woods. I call his name and he looks up at me. All he says is, get everyone inside, and the tone of his voice just makes me automatically obey. I get all the drunk teenagers inside the cottage. This is when the phrase, come at me bro, was just gaining popularity, so you can imagine the drunk kids yelling that into the woods. It was terrible. I eventually got everyone inside, and the girl isn't crying anymore, but she's visibly shaken from the experience. The boy comes back inside and tells everyone to clean up, and that we should leave as soon as possible. Everyone has trash bags and are clearing all the beer bottles and cans away. Everyone goes into the cottage, and it's only me and that boy in the sunroom now. I look at him for answers, and all he says is, It's outside. I nod and start cleaning faster. The sooner we're out of here, the sooner we're away from that thing. As we're cleaning in the sunroom, we hear knocking on the windows in multiple places. The entire sunroom is made of glass, but it's dark out 
so you can't even see outside. I immediately looked at the boy, and he just says, I ignore it. Within two seconds, someone comes running out of the bathroom and says, I'll kill whoever's outside knocking on the bathroom window, but everyone's inside and accounted for. Someone else comes running out of the bedroom, saying that there was knocking on the window in there as well. Now everyone's freaking out, and me and the boy and one of our other friends are the only sober ones to calm everyone down. We get the place clean and get outside to the cars immediately. Everyone's getting into the trucks, and I'm standing there with the boy. He's relaxed, but then all of a sudden looks behind me and shoves me into his truck. We peel out of the driveway and drop everyone off. A few days later, I end up hanging out with the boy and he tells me the story from his perspective. He said that when the boy started talking shit about the spirit, it appeared on the rocking chair behind the girl. He said he made eye contact with it and couldn't look away. They were staring each other down and that's when the girl saw his expression. He said it was instinct to defend the people he was with and ran towards it. He said that the feeling he was getting from the Kokogi was almost like it was daring him to do something. He said that the second he got up, the Kokogi stood and ran into the woods, disappearing from the patio in a blur. He ran off the porch and was looking around the lawn when he saw it standing at the tree line, looking right at him with a smile on its face. He said the whole time it felt like it was mocking him. It was then that I called his name and it disappeared. He didn't see it again until everyone was getting into the trucks, which explains why he suddenly pushed me inside. He said that it was standing on the far end of the truck, really close to us. Later that night, when he dropped everyone off, they realized that they never locked the door, so he went back to the cottage, but his friend was too scared to go in. The boy goes in by himself, but the second he opens the door, he sees the thing standing in the living room. He locks the door as quick as he can, and they peel out of the driveway. So yeah, sightings continued for a few days after that. We definitely weren't the only people on the res to have experiences like this. And then it stopped all of a sudden. It was the talk of the res. Everyone was curious about what happened to it. Would it come back? What was it? And what not? but word ended up getting around that there were sightings north of our community. White people in the town just north of us were having sightings. The other reservations were having sightings as well. It was like it was traveling north the way the stories were going. Anyway, it's 2018 now and no one else on my reserve has had any sightings of this particular thing. But yeah, that's my story. I used to work in a casino. One night, I was approached by an elderly woman asking about paging someone over the intercom. I tried explaining where to go, but she insisted I personally walk her to the desk where they can do that. As I walk her through the casino, she started talking to me. She mentioned she was a medium and how her family has always strictly advised her against sharing that information with people. When you work in a casino, you encounter a lot of scammers and odd people. I was polite, but tried not to engage with her much on the topic. As we kept walking, she said something to me about my sister. I stopped and asked how she knew my sister. She didn't, but started talking to me at great lengths about my family. At this particular time, my sister was going through a very difficult time in life that was impacting our family as a whole. I was skeptical but curious. As she went on, I was careful to neither confirm or deny anything, but just listen to what she had to say. She went into great detail about how my father, mother, and even I played into the current situation. She even began to become visibly emotional, as if she could feel what my mother was feeling. I was utterly astonished as she told me that I, being the oldest and most diplomatic in my family dynamic, needed to be more outspoken with everyone involved. Everything she had told me 
was undeniably accurate and insightful. But then, she shifted her focus. She told me about someone I worked with, and went into great detail about what this person looked like, and how they felt about me. She talked about the dynamic between us and advised me to take caution. At this point, she had lost me. I couldn't think of a single person or relationship in my working life that fit that description. I began becoming more skeptical again, and reminded her I needed to get back to work and to keep walking towards our destination. She kept talking to me as we walked, and I began to once again find myself astonished as to not just what she was telling me, but also how she would go about it, her body language, expressions, and emotional energy. As we got closer, she abruptly stopped talking. When I noticed, I did as well and turned back to her. Before I could say anything, she placed her palm at the base of my sternum, above my belly button, just below where my rib cage started. I immediately noticed a physical sensation. I became paralyzed and almost felt like she was stealing the breath from my body. I started becoming hyper aware of my surroundings the lights and dings from the electronic games, the mass amounts of people walking by, but everything seemed to be in slow motion, or almost as if I was leaving my body. It could have been only a few seconds, it could have been 20 minutes, I don't know, but I felt as if I couldn't breathe and weakness in my knees. I started to feel like I was on the verge of passing out. Casino security saw this encounter and approached us. When security interrupted us to ask what was going on, it must have startled her because I felt this shockwave through my entire body. She jerked her hand back and started apologizing profusely to me. As soon as she pulled her hand back, I was able to breathe again and gain control back of my body. I was completely freaked out. It must have been visible because security kept asking me if I was okay. I assured them everything was fine and they walked off. I turned back to the woman, still apologizing, and she said, if you don't do something about that ulcer, it's going to kill you. I was so freaked out, I told her thanks, but I have to go back to work now, and quickly headed back to my office. Not only was I in a bizarre headspace, but I noticeably was completely void of physical energy. The entire experience was the most profound encounter of my life, and I will never forget those words and physical sensation. I was having a lot of stomach issues at the time, but I was far too scared to get medical verification of an ulcer. I had already previously suspected it, and was a potential side effect of the medication I was on at the time. But if that wasn't bizarre enough on its own, it gets even weirder. The encounter happened nearly 10 years ago, and it has sat with me ever since. But recently, I was reflecting back on it. I realized that second part about the co-worker that initially made no sense, all of a sudden did. The entire situation played out in my life a few years ago. The description of the person and the very specific details were 100% spot on from what was described to me 10 years ago. I even realized that the entire situation was initiated nearly seven years to the day from the moment this woman described it to me. Not only were the two incidents separated by seven years, but the person she described I hadn't even met yet and was in an entirely different state and company. I don't know what to make of this. I've come here to see what other people's take is. I'm open to this type of stuff, but I've always approached these situations skeptically. I'd love to hear what anyone has to say about it. This happened when I was a university student. I wasn't a great student to be honest. Well, not at first. I would often skip classes and just mess around with my friends. There was one girl at college who made me want to go in every now and then though. I didn't have the guts to ask her on a date at the time this took place, so I had my friend and his girlfriend invite her out with us. It was fine because my friend and his girlfriend were mutual friends. 
Someone suggested going on a drive at night. My friend and I were really into ghost hunting and stuff like that, so we would often try and find somewhere interesting to test our courage. We had heard a rumor of a place just on the outskirts of town, which was supposed to be haunted. It was this abandoned building down a dark country lane out in the woods. It used to be a high-end lodge that people could rent out as it had these great views over the lake. That's another reason we chose to go there. Could be kind of romantic at night, right? Also, we had the chance to show the girls we were brave by exploring the abandoned lodge. Rumor had it that one of the rooms inside the lodge was covered in blood spatter, so we went inside, all of us, searching for that room so we could get a photo to show our friends. Well, it turned out that the legend wasn't true. It was just an abandoned building. There was the usual stuff like graffiti, broken glass, and weeds growing all over the place. Besides those things, not much out of the ordinary. We took a walk down close to the lake, but it had gotten far too dark at that point to make out anything. Had it been a full moon, it might have been a bit better. We decided to head back to the car and drive home. I was driving that night, and my friend rode shotgun with me, and the girls were in the back. The girl I was into was sat behind me. Even though we didn't see anything spooky or even get a decent view of the lake, we were all pretty happy with our trip out into the woods. I mean, it was pretty fun to walk around expecting to be scared. There was tension and excitement. Plus, it was kind of a date, so all those feelings were heightened. It was a nice night. We all wanted to get a drink and some snacks, and someone spotted a convenience store on the way to the abandoned lodge, so we were headed there. Before we could even get off the dirt roads we had traveled down, I spotted something. On the way to the abandoned lodge, we noticed a phone booth, and when we were heading back, I noticed that there was someone stood beside the phone booth. It was a man wearing a business suit. When he saw us approaching, he began to wave one of his hands at us, indicating us to stop. My friend said to me something along the lines of, Hey, I bet that guy wants us to give him a ride. I replied by telling him there wasn't enough space. I mean the car was only a four-seater. I didn't think the girls would want the strangers sat in between them. Either way, I guessed that the right thing to do would be to stop and see what he wanted, right? It would look pretty gentlemanly of me to do so, and I would have looked pretty bad if we didn't stop. So I pulled the car to a stop. I already planned on telling him we couldn't give him a ride, but if he wanted, we could call him a taxi or something. The guy wandered over to us, and he stood with one arm on the roof of the car, and one behind his back as he leaned in to speak to me through the crack I made in the window. Hey guys, glad you stopped. Listen, I got a puncture in my tire and I don't have a phone on me. What do you say? Can you give me a ride? He was a guy in his late twenties, I would say, maybe early thirties. He looked honest, you know. I didn't see his bike or his car anywhere, but he had a face you could trust. I was considering asking my friend to sit in the back and have this guy sit up front. I would only give him a ride as far as the convenience store. As I was mulling this over and preparing my reply, the girl who I had a crush on in the back starts going crazy like she's screaming and kicking the chair, then shouts at me. It totally threw me. She shouted at me to drive, hurry up and drive. I did exactly as she said, because I could sense the absolute terror in her voice. So we sped away, leaving the guy who wanted a ride looking puzzled and annoyed. I didn't slow down until she calmed down in the back. The car was full of the sounds of fear, hyperventilation, and confusion. We parked up at the convenience store. Everyone was a little calmer, so we asked what our friend saw. Didn't you see it? She said. The guy had a kitchen knife behind his back. No one goes into the woods with a knife like that. I don't know or want to know what that guy had planned for us with that knife. I don't even know why he was out there with a knife like that in the middle of the night. I do know that we had a close call that night. I was so close to letting that guy in, 
he would have convinced me. After that night, we stopped going to supposedly haunted places at night. We found out that humans can be way more frightening. Hi everyone. This incident happened about five years ago. This is a story that I never really tell anymore because most people are either uncomfortable hearing it or make well-meaning comments about what I should have done in this situation without really understanding how differently your mind works when you're experiencing absolute panic. But you guys seem to get it, so here's my story. I was living in a relatively nice apartment in downtown Memphis, working as an ophthalmic technician. I arrived home from work at my usual time around 4.30 p.m., unlocked my door and went inside. I set my phone, wallet, and keys on the kitchen island, hearing my heavy metal front door swing shut loudly behind me, and began taking care of some errands around the house. Having grown up in a small town, it was habit for me not to lock my door during the day, especially when I knew my husband would be home soon anyway. I've never forgotten to lock my door once in the five years since this day. I walked through my bathroom and into my large walk-in closet and began hanging up the laundry that I'd started earlier in the day before work. My front door opened and I smiled with surprise. My husband was home a little early, and I happily called out to him, I'm in here, love. I was met with silence and slowly began to feel that sinking feeling of something is wrong crawl up my spine. I tried to shake it off thinking my husband simply hadn't heard me and walked out into my living room kitchen area. Standing on the other side of my kitchen island was a complete stranger. He was male, older than me, I would estimate 50s, but it's hard for me to recall exact facial features or details from this moment, and was just standing there, staring at me. No ski mask, no weapon, just watching me. I wondered if he'd maybe walked into the wrong apartment and was going to apologize and leave, but as he continued to stare, I realized I needed to do something other than just gape at the stranger in my house. I stood taller, puffed up my chest in an attempt to look more threatening, which is hard to do as I'm a small female, and used a loud, clear voice telling him to get out of my apartment, that he had no business being here. He completely ignored me, like I hadn't spoken. Then he began to pick up my things, my cell phone, my keys, my wallet. He picked them up methodically and put them into his own pockets. That's when it truly hit me that this person was dangerous. I was naive enough to believe this was all a mistake until that moment. I darted forward toward the only other device I had that would allow me to get help, my computer. I had to take a few steps closer to the intruder in order to reach it, but I still had about 12 to 15 feet between us, so I knew I could grab it and run before he could reach me. As I picked it up and turned to run, I saw him start to move after me, and I sprinted back toward the bathroom because it was the only place I could go and put two locked doors between us my bathroom door, and the closet door. I slammed and locked the first door, and within seconds I could hear him messing with it, trying to open it. I ran into the closet and locked that door too, opening my computer and getting on Facebook Messenger to contact my husband. I sent message after message pleading with him to call 911 and tell them there was an intruder in the apartment. He got the messages within minutes and assured me that he had a dispatcher on the phone and was leaving work himself to try and get to me if he could. I waited and waited. The bathroom door opened and the intruder came inside. He moved to the closet door and started trying to break that door down too. Here's the part where people usually start giving me advice on how I should have acted, but all I can tell you is that I was frozen, with fear, with shock, I don't know, but I didn't scream or cry or search for a weapon in that dark closet. I didn't brace the door or try to hold it closed. I just kneeled in my closet and waited to die because I just knew that's what was going to happen. People like to tell me that I lived in an apartment. Surely, if I'd screamed, someone would have heard me and come to help. Surely, there was something heavy enough in my closet to use to defend myself. Hell, even the laptop I had would hurt if I swung it at someone. Why didn't I do anything? I don't really have an answer for that. But the closet door miraculously held. I heard frustrated footsteps go back out into the living room area of my apartment. I heard things breaking, bottles shattering, my drawers and refrigerator and cabinets being flung open as things were torn out of them. I continued to sit in that closet silently crying, wanting to leave but feeling that death was inevitable. 
I feel awful about my selfishness in that moment, but I messaged my mom who lived a 15 hours drive away and told her what was happening. I desperately wanted comfort and to tell her how much I love her. I'm not a parent, but I can only imagine the fear and helplessness I put her through knowing her daughter was in danger and there was nothing she could do to help. She messaged me constantly, begging me to keep replying. I told her I would as long as I could, but I also told her to tell my brothers I love them, to help my husband through whatever happened next if it ended badly for me. The intruder started messing with the closet door again, mumbling disjointed words that I couldn't really distinguish. I remember hoping that the police would get to the apartment before my husband, that he wouldn't be the one to find me in whatever state this invader left me in. The front door opened again, and it was my husband shouting for me. The intruder walked out toward the living room kitchen area again, where my front door was located, and I opened the door and darted from the closet to find my husband on the ground with him, pinning him in place. The man kept mumbling, at times yelling, but never really put up much resistance. This entire part is a blur for me. I remember feeling like the room was spinning, filled with fear, mostly for my husband at this point. Eventually, the police found the apartment. It took them about 25 minutes to arrive, which still blows my mind. I know time seems to move slowly during scary situations, so I thought it was less than that. But from the time my husband dialed 911 to the time the officers arrived, it was 25 excruciating minutes. This isn't intended to bash them in any way, it just always seemed like this was an unusually long response time for a home invasion. They got my things back from the man and took him out of my apartment. I numbly went through the process of filing a police report telling them what happened. One of the officers commented that I should really keep my door locked at all times. I remember feeling like he was being insensitive at the time or blaming me for what happened but later recognized his words were coming from experience. I'm sure he's seen the situation end differently for other women. Within 30 minutes, the scariest incident of my life was over, but I've carried the fear, the violation, the anxiety of having someone intrude into my space for years. If it happened to me once, it could happen again. If you made it this far, thanks for listening. Please consider continuing because this isn't all doom and gloom. If this or something similar has happened to you and you're still struggling with the aftermath of it, the sleepless nights, the laying awake, listening for sounds of forced entry, the nightmares, the constant checking and rechecking your locks, this is what eventually helped me. A year after this took place, my husband and I moved to the Midwest for his job. We selected a safe town with a nice apartment complex and chose a third floor apartment with only one point of entry. I looked up every statistic on crime for the neighborhood, finding that an isolated incidence of car theft was the only thing reported in decades. I still couldn't sleep at night. It was definitely better than staying in the same apartment in Memphis, but my husband often works night shifts now and I simply couldn't continue being terrified to sleep at night. I realized my biggest fear wasn't that something could happen again, but that if it did, I was just as unprepared now as I was then. I hadn't changed anything other than locking my door, and I knew I would likely freeze up again and leave my life up to being able to hide well enough, or having a door hold long enough to save me, and that was unacceptable. I walked into a martial arts school with an excellent self-defense program, introduced myself, and started taking classes. At first I was quiet, hiding in the back of the room and generally keeping to myself. My instructor, who is both incredibly kind and incredibly insightful, slowly built up my confidence and brought me out of my bubble of fear. After several months of training, I finally shared my reason for taking classes with him, and he's worked with me tirelessly to give me the ability to protect myself in any environment. I've been training for years now, and the difference it has made in every aspect of my life is unbelievable. The meek, quiet girl that waited to die in her closet doesn't exist. I am confident, I am strong, I am worthy of living and protecting myself in my home. I no longer am ashamed of how I handled the situation I was in, but I also understand what steps I can take to ensure that I'm safe. It wasn't easy and it didn't happen overnight, but it was worth it. I recognize this might not be a solution or option for everyone. Your experience is valid and however you decide to cope with your own story is the right choice for you. This is how I happened to do it and it worked well for me. Thank you again for listening. I'm a little afraid to share this because I'm not sure how people will respond, but maybe doing so will help someone else that's feeling alone with this. If anyone is struggling with their own story and wants a kind ear to listen to, 
I'm here. Stay safe out there. This happened when I was 14. I'm 17 at the moment and still linger on the memory. I was home alone that night as my mom was working an overnight shift and my older brother didn't live at home at the time. So therefore, I had the house to myself. I'd say it was maybe 9 or 9.30 p.m. and I was in my room working on homework and listening to music with my headphones in, loud enough to where I really couldn't hear things. I remember for a fact that all of the doors were locked, and I stayed home alone pretty often, so I didn't have a reason to worry. Maybe an hour later, I decided to take my headphones out and take a break from homework. I heard noises in my kitchen and footsteps walking around downstairs, which was odd because my mom wasn't supposed to be home until 7am the next morning, but she could have taken an early night for whatever reason. But just to make sure, I locked my bedroom door and texted her, asking if she came home. It took her around 10 minutes to respond, but when she did, she said no. She was still at work, and why, I asked. At that point, I was freaking out, because my mom and my brother are the only ones with keys to the house, and myself, of course. So I decided to text my brother. Sure enough, he said no. He wasn't in the house, so I told both him and my mother about the situation, and my brother wasn't far from the house, so he said he would be there soon, and to call the cops. As I was trying to find a hiding spot in my room with my phone to call the police, I heard my name called from downstairs. That got me thinking, did whoever was in the house know me personally? A friend of the family, maybe? I didn't respond out of fear of who knew my name and was calling it, and I didn't recognize the voice. I called the cops and was on the phone with them, and when my name was called again, followed by, I know you're up there, and I heard someone start to walk up the stairs. Again, I didn't respond, but I was terrified. The police assured me that they were on their way and to stay put. I was still texting my brother while this was all happening. He informed me that he was five minutes away. That's when I heard the front door slam. After I heard the door slam, about five minutes later the police arrived and assured me it was them and that I could come out. Shortly after, my brother arrived back home. The police looked around the property and all over the house, but there was no trace of whomever was once here. However, there was damage on the door and lock from being forced open, and it looked to be done by some sort of tool to pick the lock. Everything turned out okay because nothing was taken, oddly enough. But the upsetting part is whomever was in my house wasn't found. From that night forward, though, we got cameras installed and got a better lock. I've had a handful of paranormal experiences in my life. I would like to eventually share them all, but this was the first experience and it really scared me growing up. I haven't told many people, as it's kind of hard to bring up what you've seen, like a ghost in normal conversations. Nevertheless, I wanted to share my experience with all of you to see what you think. I was 12 years old at the time, and my parents were in the early stages of a fairly nasty divorce. There was about a month-long spam when my brothers and I knew something was up. My parents would have hushed arguments late into the night with the occasional outburst. These arguments normally ended with my mother leaving to stay at a friend's house for the night. One night during this period, I awoke to the sound of one of their brief outbursts. I immediately noticed it was significantly darker in our room than normal. We always slept with our bedroom door open and the hallway bathroom light on. However, tonight my door had been shut. This wasn't completely out of the ordinary during this time since my parents would close our door when they were arguing in an attempt not to wake us. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, 
I noticed the silhouette of a figure in front of my closed bedroom door. The best I can describe it, and bear with me here, is that it was a human-shaped dark gray form. It was semi-transparent and perhaps five foot four or so. The figure was definitely human-shaped, but had no details. I couldn't make out a face or any features. It seemed to have the shape, or maybe the feel, of a woman, which I know sounds crazy. Its transparency increased towards the knees, leading up to no feet. Kind of like your stereotypical Casper ghost, without the little tail. It stayed completely still, but also seemed to be moving within itself, maybe like a swirling mist. I would make out a definitive outline and figure that I knew was abnormal. I was mortified. I stayed frozen in my bed for what seemed like forever, keeping my eyes locked on whatever was in my room. I felt like it was staring at me the whole time and was aware I saw it. I could still hear my parents' hushed arguments in the kitchen, and decided getting to them was my only option for safety. However, this thing in my room was between me and them. Honestly, I do not know what the hell I was thinking, but I made a run for it. To this day, I can still vividly remember running as fast as I could, straight at the figure, bracing for impact with it, watching it vanish as I went through it, and slamming straight into my bedroom door, which is a little humorous looking back on it. But I remained composure, opened my bedroom door, and sprinted to the kitchen. By the time I reached the kitchen, my mum had just left, and my dad was shutting the garage door. I really can't remember what I told him, but I know I didn't tell him what had just happened. I'm pretty sure I just said I had a nightmare and wanted to sleep in his bed with him that night. He agreed and we went down the hallway to his room. I remember clutching onto him as we passed my bedroom and asking what was going on. But the rest of the night was uneventful. My parents officially separated about a week later, and for the next few months I had an extremely rough time sleeping at my dad's house. I would wake up in the middle of the night, and would frequently stare at my doorway for the watching figure. Most of the time, when this happened, I would run to my dad's room and get into bed with him. I remember him asking what was going on, but I'd never tell him. I just said I was scared, and I'm sure he chalked it up to a child struggling with a divorce. I'm 27 now, and I think about this experience from time to time. I told my parents about that night a few years ago, and they both have each had their own unrelated paranormal experiences in their lives, and are open to the possibility that I truly did have a paranormal experience that night. My dad a little more so than mum. Anytime we have talked about that night, she gets a little weird and says, I could have dreamt the whole thing, but I know what I saw. Upon further reflection, I really don't think that it was a negative being. I was scared at the time, but never felt like it wanted to hurt me. I think I was more scared of not knowing what it was and knowing that it wasn't normal. Sometimes I feel like it could have been a relative, perhaps my grandmother who had passed away that was watching over my brothers and I while we slept, or while we were going through the divorce. Regardless of what it was, it really changed my life, and I wanted to share this with all of you. This didn't happen to me, but it happened to someone who works at my company. He's not the type to share stuff like this online, but I am, so I got his permission. I found it pretty creepy and interesting, and I hope you do too. Back when this took place, he was really into photography. I mean this guy was really obsessed with it. He needed to get the right camera, the right lens. For the longest time, it was all he spent his money on. It didn't stop there. Every time he took time off of work, he was flying off someplace to take more photos. He would be up early or stay out someplace until the morning light. He loved taking photos of the mountains and the sea at sunrise or sunset. He took photos of wildlife, especially birds, and he favored wide shots of landscapes. After a while, he got tired of taking photos of the same sort of stuff though. Well... 
It was either that or he couldn't get the time off he wanted from our boss. I think that was what led him to trying to shoot something a bit more locally. He got a new lens or a new camera, I can't remember. He said that he was going to shoot some photos of the stars at night. There was a place not too far away from where he lived. He lived on the outskirts of town beneath the shadow of a mountain. What better place to take some photos of the constellations? It took next to no time for him to get up to the top of the mountain while riding his motorbike. He said that if he went late enough like he planned on, then he was sure that even the hiking trails would be empty. Riding up those trails would make his journey a lot shorter, but a lot more dangerous. It was illegal, but he thought he would get away with it. There wasn't much of police presence in his town apparently. He knew the area and the risk, so he was confident that he would be up and down without anyone noticing. He said there was a clearing at the top of the mountain where the street lights were scarce. There was nothing but natural light up there. That's where he wanted to be. Well, he pulled up at the place he wanted to be at and kicked the stand of his bike out. He put it out of sight under a tree, just in case. He took a bunch of photos, tried them from all sorts of angles. He said he was completely immersed in taking his photos since there was a full moon out and there was a cloudless sky that served as his canvas. His concentration was disrupted when he heard the sound of a vehicle pulling into the observation area parking lot. He had driven up the trail and not up the road, therefore he had a kind of aerial advantage over the car that had just pulled into the parking area. At that time of night, he thought it might just be some kids looking for a quiet place to either drink or fool around in, or both. If that wasn't the case, it wouldn't be great if they found a guy on his own lurking in the bushes with a bunch of camera equipment. Since he didn't know who was going to emerge from the vehicle, he hid in the bushes by the tree where his bike was. Someone pulled in. It stopped in the opposite area of the parking lot. He looked on, expecting a bunch of youngsters to pour out, but only one figure came out of the driver's side door. He wasn't young. He was about the same age as my colleague, if not older. He got out of what my friend now saw was a van, and he started going back and forth with something in his hands. It looked as if he was unloading something. He had two armfuls of something, and he headed off into the woods with whatever that was. Then he came back to get more of it from his van. Well, my colleague retracted into the bushes once again after he saw that. He said that he didn't want to be found by that guy. He admitted that he hid in the bushes until the guy in the van completed doing whatever he was doing. That back and forth trip from the van to the woods. Once he heard the van pull away, he came out from under the cover of darkness and left on his motorbike. I was told this story in front of some others. It was on a night out. Some of our senior colleagues were all like, Wait, what? That's it. It was probably some guy fly-tipping, dumping his garbage out in the middle of nowhere. Someone else said, Yeah, why didn't you call him out on that? Then someone asked, What did it look like he was ditching out there anyway? It couldn't have been anything important. Well, I figured that this guy didn't tell us the story for nothing, so I eagerly awaited his response and he took a deep breath and said, It wasn't garbage. Whatever it was, was wrapped in cloth or some kind of clothing, and he hugged it to his chest. He hugged it tight, and he spoke to it. He spoke to it while he walked off into the woods. The mountains at night can hide many things, I guess. He reported what he saw, but he didn't speak another word about what happened that night, again. About ten or so years ago, I moved into a quiet residential area. I was really excited to live there. The neighborhood looked perfect. It looked like something out of a wholesome made-for-daytime TV movie. And the neighbors were all so nice. They came to greet me as I was unloading boxes from the moving truck. They said things like, If you need anything, all you gotta do is ask. My partner and I were really happy there for about five years or so. 
The happiness ended when I found out that my partner was cheating on me. She divorced me, and moved out, and in with her new man. We didn't have kids, but I foolishly put their mortgage solely in my name, and she wasn't interested in how much financial pressure she put me under. I had no choice but to live alone. As a couple, we had participated often in community events and festivals, but since she left, I didn't feel like going to any events anymore. I guess that I didn't want to see the sympathetic looks and hear the probing questions. Plus, in order to keep a roof over my head, I needed to work more. I barely had a moment to myself, let alone time for neighborhood events. One day I decided to formally resign from the community association, and as soon as I did that, something changed in the neighborhood. The atmosphere had shifted. After I left the community association, Everyone in the neighborhood began to ignore me. I would say hello to the family across the street, but they would pretend like they didn't hear or see me. I didn't get it because the guy was really nice, and I thought that we got on well whenever we spoke. He was the kind of guy to speak about anything. It was as if his tongue was scared of the dark. I remember one time he spoke to me for about ten minutes about his garbage, so this was highly unusual. It wasn't just him and his family, it was everyone. All my neighbors were pretending like I didn't exist. It was clear that I was being targeted. I guess that they must have felt as if they were really upsetting me, but to be honest, they weren't. I was fine with not having to speak to them. People who ignore others like that are incredibly narrow-minded in my opinion, so why would I want them as acquaintances? However, my indifference to their stupid ignoring game only served to irritate them. They ramped up their targeting behavior. Thinking back on it, maybe I should have tried to make amends, but I don't think it would have made much difference. The harassment began as a direct response to my ignoring of them. I woke up one morning to find trash all over my lawn. It was as if it had been deliberately thrown there. I didn't see who did it, so I couldn't be sure it was one of my neighbors. It could have just as easily been a cat or a crow, but I had my suspicions. I cleaned it up and kept my suspicions to myself for the time being. But then something else happened. The garbage I threw out in the communal garbage area was put back in my garbage can. I knew that this couldn't be the work of animals. Not wanting to make an issue out of it, I just put the same bag back out again and went out to work. When I came home, I found that it had been returned back to my garbage can once again. If it was a one-off, I could have understood it, but it wasn't. It happened time and time again. I decided to install some home surveillance cameras. I hoped that this would help me monitor what was going on while I was at work. However, as soon as the cameras were up, the harassment stopped. I had no evidence. It was a nice place to live, and if this was all they had to irritate me with, and a camera stopped it, then I thought, hey, I don't need to worry. I didn't have to talk to my neighbors anymore. I didn't need to sponsor their kids' run or waste my weekends with small talk around the barbecue. For me, it felt like a win. But then the silent calls came. Someone kept calling my home phone, and whenever I picked it up, they said nothing. So I disconnected the phone line. I used my mobile phone more anyway, so I kind of made a saving. When my home phone number was out of service, I started getting the calls on my mobile. It didn't seem as if it was going to end. This went on for a long time. I felt so exhausted by it all. I know that it all sounds relatively minor, but if you put yourself in my shoes, you would see what I mean. Imagine everyone in the neighborhood ignoring you, and then trying to find a new way to mess with you at every opportunity they could. They did other things that I don't even want to repeat. Enough was enough. As nice as the area was, it wasn't worth all of this, I thought. I found a new place to live, and after a while, I was able to carve out a situation where I was able to leave, so I decided to move. On moving day, all the neighbors crowded around to watch me stack boxes in the rental van. They stood there silently, grinning, enjoying what they had done. I hated that, so I had to speak up. I had to get something off my chest. What the hell is wrong with you people? I shouted at them. Look, when you join the community association, you don't leave it. People who break the rules of the community don't belong here. So, 
What do you want from us? We're glad you're leaving. This is a family community. And you don't fit the bill anymore, do you? My neighbor across the street said. I had no words. It was like a cult. And it was all I could do not to haul off and hit the guy. And rules? What rules? Oh, so sorry guys, my wife left me. Please give me another chance to live in your creepy society. What a bunch of cruel-hearted people I unfortunately used to call my neighbors. That experience taught me to thoroughly investigate and research the area I choose to live in. I'm doing much better now. I've never been a big fan of camping, circa 2012. For some reason or another, my friend and I decided to take a Saturday night to camp on private property on the bank of a small lake in the rural American Southwest. The lake wasn't very large, probably only about 50 to 150 yards across. It was more of a deep pond, but it was five times as long as it was wide, and from the perspective of our camp, it consumed the majority of our sightline. The plot of land itself wasn't entirely removed from civilization. We were five to ten miles outside of a small suburb of a mid-sized southern city. It definitely was not easy to access, however, and the only way in was a gated, narrow dirt road across a levee which spanned one side of the lake. This road was gated and locked. The owner gave us his code. We pulled the car through and locked the gate behind us. If you've ever been down south, you know how quickly it gets isolated outside of cities. Our cities are small and the rural people around often live rough and wild. We have dense woods, so thick that they're not worth building in unless you have some connection or attachment to the area. I've heard it was not profitable to cut roads through a lot of it when they were building highways in the 50s so not much development has happened in the last hundred years, and in some places since the Civil War. It's not uncommon to go for a 30-minute drive straight out of town and come upon cabins that are obviously off the grid. My friend and I were used to living in the suburbs, so we were just happy to see the stars and hear the sounds of nature. We were at our very utilitarian camp, simply looking around and enjoying the night when suddenly my buddy sat up real straight. He said something like, Do you see that guy over there? He pointed to the other side of the small lake. I didn't see anything. I sat up slightly and said, Nah, it's just the dark playing tricks on you. He seemed actually shaken. No, look, there's a bunch of faces behind the trees now. That got my attention and I sat up fully, rubbing my eyes to try to gain focus. And then I saw them. Small, round, white faces stared back at me from across the lake. Maybe 15 to 20 of them. All were positioned in such a way that their bodies were behind the trees, and only their heads were visible. The best way I can describe the faces is like very pale, somehow internally illuminated children. I should mention that neither of us were drinking or high. We were too young for that, not for at least a few more years. We'd eaten dinner at home and were just planning on going to sleep after chilling out for a while. The faces weren't moving. I was kind of sitting there in shock, thinking that my eyes would adjust and I would see that they were a reflection, bugs or owls or something, but I would never come to that realization. I stared right back at them for what felt like five minutes, looked back at my friend, and then they were gone. Bodies of water carry sound extremely well, and we heard extensive shuffling from the other side of the lake, and a couple of small branches snap. It's incredible what your ears pick up on during an otherwise silent night. My buddy was tearing up a little when he said, What the hell were those? And I didn't have a good answer. Neither of us slept particularly well, and I definitely felt validated in my feelings of disliking camping. But what were we going to do? I tried to do some research on the internet, but never found a phenomenon that could explain that.
There are some really, really messed up reasons to live in a haunted house. I, being of sound mind and body, don't know any of them, but I am superstitious as all hell. So when the wife and I moved up to New Hampshire, right on the Vermont border, we were looking for a place to rent for a year or two before buying a house. Now, for all the New Englanders here, my wife is a native. I'm not. She's used to New England and the vast emptiness this small area has. There are places even she won't let me travel to after a certain hour, because that route you have to take, people don't come back from. Of course, I'm not a native, so I don't know this. So when I would come home late after dark from work and tell her I took X route, she would kind of look in shock and awe at my stupidity. We found a home right on the above-mentioned border, on the Vermont side. We loved it. It was a fantastic place to live, except the basement. I could not shake the feeling of being watched and stalked, like prey. So, like any reasonable adult, I just said fuck it and didn't go down there except during the day. One night, after gaming for hours in my loft-slash-office-slash-man cave, I got hungry. Went downstairs, kissed the missus, and walked past my basement door towards the kitchen. I don't know if anyone reading has gone hunting, but there is a moment you sometimes experience, especially hunting predators like coyote, wolf, bear, etc. Sometimes they know you have them in your sight. Sometimes they look towards you, not quite at you, but it feels like they are boring into your soul, saying, You got me. Make it quick. It's an eerie feeling, and sometimes you take the shot, sometimes you don't. On that night, as I was walking past the door downstairs, I saw red eyes in a humanoid figure, and I froze. I stopped dead in my fucking tracks. I gave that same look of, you got me, make it quick. After that momentary lapse of sanity, I just scooted real quickly away from the door, grabbed a weapon, and called my wife, saying someone was downstairs, call the police. There is no other entrance to the basement, and I had the door covered with my weapon from a safe position, where I could easily run from the house. Cops show up, I disarm, they clear the house, they find no person, but a set of muddy footprints that start facing up towards the stairs that then proceed to walk into a wall in the back corner of the basement by the water heater. For some context, the wall in question also blocked off the area directly under my bedroom. It was a solid wall with a small crawl space and about maybe four inches of clearance on the other side of it. Cops call detectives. Detectives check it. Can't see anyone in it. They can't enter it. Photographs are taken, shoe sizes compared, my feet are too big, wife's are too small. We got a good contact number for the detective, and the wife and I would stay at a hotel for a couple of nights. For months afterwards, I would have the same thing happen, eventually, minus the cops. It actually got relatively normal. Good old red eyes in the basement, chillin' like a villain. Wife was less enthused by my antics cheerfully just going about, and when I would spot red eyes, I'd always give him a cheery, good, insert time of the day, how you doing? Of which, we would still have muddy footprints, and I would just clean them up. So, COVID hits, lockdowns happen, and we have an opportunity to move to a better house, one where we would be able to work from home better. The main reason the home was better was we had a mold issue in this house, it was in between the panes of glass and the windows. Every day we were cleaning it up from the window sills, door frames. Hell, we had to replace pieces of furniture multiple times, and we are very clean people. We notified the landlord over multiple months, and eventually a year. And after their inactions, their not helping at all, we decided to move. Landlord decided to get a housing inspector out there immediately after we left. Inspector comes and verifies there is a mold issue. I don't know if they met red eyes. However, 
They did find a metric ton of readings of high spore counts on the walls bordering the space below our old bedroom, the wall where the footprints always ended. So, since it was filled, the inspector scoops a little bit of the earth on the other side of the wall, through the crawl space. It wasn't earth as in dirt. It was approximately seven feet of mold. The landlord then immediately contacted specialists to remove all of it and notified me to offer some kind of damages for it. This was in the form of refunded partial rent payments. All in all, made my 2020 pretty good until about three months later. Landlord calls me and offers to send me a full refund of all rent from the time I was living there, minus what she already gave. Why? There was a corpse. The medical examiner said that it was the man who owned the property before my landlord. He was a line man who, after talking to surviving family members, wore a size 8 shoe, smaller than my size 11, bigger than my wife's shoes by a mile. Fuck me, Red Eyes. I don't know how you got there, but hell, bud. I hope you now found peace. Sorry for not checking it out sooner. I did, after reading about his obituary and contacting his family, swing by his final resting place to drop off flowers, place a stone, and share a good morning like I used to. Till better times, Red Eyes. This happened a couple of years ago. I was walking my dog Indy in my local field. It was dark, but it wasn't late. It was winter time in the UK, so it was maybe 6pm. The field is mainly used for rugby and football, but it's completely free to walk through whenever. It's also surrounded by houses and streetlights on the roads, but the field itself is dark. So I had brought a torch with me, mainly so I didn't step in any dog shit. I've come in one entrance of the field, and I'm following a path that leads to another. I use the field to make a loop back around onto the road and back to my house, giving my dog some off-lead time whilst in the field. Anyway, as I'm walking up the field, I notice a figure in the entrance I was going to use to leave. I keep my eye on this figure as they have very dark clothing on and their hood up. I'm shining my torch as I'm walking so I know the person knows I'm there as it's very obvious. At first, I wasn't nervous, more so just being vigilant. Indy is a wonderful German Shepherd, so as you can imagine, I feel pretty safe with her. It wasn't until I saw the person duck down behind a bush that I absolutely froze. I was about 200 feet from the exit, but would have to walk past the bush they hid behind to get to it. I call Indy over and get her back on the lead so she's close. By this point, she's also hyper alert due to the person behind the bush. With that, I hear a weird, high-pitched voice that sounded like they were saying my dog's name. They said it three or four times in this long-doubt high-pitched voice. It's clearly coming from the person hiding. Luckily, Indy wasn't reacting to it as it probably barely sounded like her name to her. I had a moment of, shall I fight or flight? Either I won, run past the bush and try for the exit, two, turn around and run back into the dark field and make for the other exit, or three, confront this fuck. Indy at this point is hackles up, ears up, and very alert in front of me, all whilst still maintaining a wonderful sense of calm. I went with number three. I confronted him. I mustered up every bit of courage and confidence I had and shouted at the top of my voice, What the fuck are you doing? The hooded man came out from the bushes very quickly without saying anything, and I said the same thing again. What the fuck are you doing trying to scare a young woman? He started to stutter and said, Oh, uh, I thought he was someone I knew. I answered back and said, Who hides from someone they think they know in a dark field? After that, he apologized a couple of times and continued to skulk down the rest of the field and I made for a swift exit with Indy. God knows what his intentions were, 
Maybe he thought I had a smaller dog and was going to try to attack me. Maybe he saw Indy and realized, no chance. Or maybe he really did think I was someone he knew. Whatever it was, it was weird and scary. I'll try to give as much detail as possible and keep this from going on for too long. This happened back in the summer of 2015 when I was serving in the United States Army Reserves. I was stationed in southern Alabama in a transportation company. Sometimes my girlfriend would come with me on drill weekends and we would crash at a friend of hers apartment, which is where this incident took place. This particular weekend, we were in a large convoy in the middle of nowhere on some back road out in the sticks, well over a hundred miles from the city. This was when I got the most confusing, bizarre, and downright creepy phone call of my young life. She was in utter hysterics. She was crying and screaming, wondering why I would frighten her so badly, what the F my problem was, and asking me how I even pulled it off. After I was finally able to calm her down, this is the story she relayed to me. Sometime that afternoon, her friend was at work, and she was at the apartment by herself. Suddenly, there was a loud bang on the door. Not a knock, several loud and violent bangs. After looking through the peephole, she saw me, but there was something off. She says I was wearing my army uniform. It looked like me, but that I had this very angry, aggravated look on my face. She opened the door wondering why I was home so early, and apparently, without saying a word, I angrily blew past her, shoulder-checking her into the wall, and quickly walked down the hall, taking a left into the bedroom, slamming the door behind me so hard the whole place shook. She was very alarmed and confused about why I was home so early, and in such an agitated state. I mean, that is so out of character for me, I'm not a violent guy at all. On top of that, if something did happen to set me off, she would have been the first to hear about it. So she's walking behind me, trying to get some information out of me, and she opens the bedroom door behind me and sees the closet door slam shut. She proceeds to run over to see what I was doing in her friend's closet and claims that when she opened the door, it was completely empty. That was when she had a panic attack and called me. Imagine my shock and confusion hearing that story, knowing that I was well over a hundred miles away at the time. She finally believed me after I sent a photo with my current GPS location, which only served to freak her out more. I thought there must be some kind of rational explanation for what she saw. I will be honest and say it, she did smoke a little weed here and there, but at the time, I know she was sober. She did not mess around with hard drugs or drink, and she had no mental illness of any kind. Over the years after that happened, I came to learn about doppelgangers. I don't know what they mean, what they represent, or why they come around. All I know is that they are creepy as hell, and a girl I dated for several years came face to face with mine, and it put the fear of God into the poor girl. Take from this story what you will, but honestly, I don't care if anyone believes it or not, I just have to get it off my chest. She and I are no longer together, not that that's relevant, but we are still good friends and I called her this morning to talk about, quote, the scariest moment of her life, as she puts it. According to her, it looked exactly like me, same eye and hair color, same height and everything. The only difference between my doppelganger and me was temperament. I'm a very easygoing dude, and she and I didn't fight or argue much. I mean, she's seen me angry before, obviously, and even when I was angry with her, we had good communication. I've never been that kind of guy who gets mad and doesn't speak to someone, especially a significant other, because frankly, that's assholeish and immature. According to her, this thing wanted in, and from the way it was pounding on the door, harder and harder, it eventually would have come in one way or another. Then, for whatever reason, it practically ran over her trying to get down the hall. So this dude was in a hurry, and he was pissed the hell off. 
I'm not a small guy and she claims this put a nasty bruise on her shoulder as she hit the wall. This is also very out of character for me as I never have laid a hand on any woman in my life. A decade ago, one of my neighbors disappeared. Since he was an old man and I did not meet him very often, I didn't know that he was missing. One night I fell asleep and had the weirdest dream. I was in a hospital room. There was a corpse, a huge corpse, that was covered with a white sheet. There was also a TV, and a woman on the TV screen started to talk about a murder. Suddenly, I saw blood appearing on this white sheet, like the corpse was bleeding. I left that room with this heavy feeling of sadness. I was walking on the street and checked my pockets. I didn't have any money, and that made me even more unhappy. I ended up in a neighborhood that I knew well. Then someone that I could not see started to torture me. I remember clearly everything that happened. My murderer cut my legs with an axe. He also burned my skin with a cigarette. I was so frustrated. There was this old man that looked at the whole scene but did not move a finger. I saw the exact place where my invisible murderer lived. Then I woke up crying. That was such a vivid dream. I told my mom about the dream and a couple of hours she went out for shopping. When she came back, she told me that my neighbor was found dead in the same exact circumstances that I saw in my dream. I really tried to talk to his wife and the police, but they would not listen to me. I know where this monster lives. I don't know what he looks like, but I know his place. The police did not find him. It happened almost 10 years ago. I feel responsible and sad, really sad. I believe that his spirit reached out to me in that dream. He wanted his truth to be told. I'm really heartbroken. I live in Europe, and police don't believe in mediums or paranormal experiences. I shared this because someone asked me for more paranormal experiences, and this is one of the few I've had. I was once working as a receptionist at a five-star resort that's about 45 minutes away from the city center. Everyone who has worked in tourism or hospitality knows that there are certain periods during the year where it's busier than usual, for example, peak season. And this incident happened during peak season. The resort was overbooked and guests were checking into their rooms one after another at the reception counter. I was almost done checking in this nice lovely couple when I saw this family of five standing behind them and tried to finish up the whole check-in process so that I could assist the family that was next in line. You must be thinking that when I said family of five, it's the parents and three kids, right? But it's actually two kids one elderly woman who, at that time, I assume was either the husband or the wife's mother. Now, the resort's policy was to get the details of every guest that were staying in the resort and it is for a good reason, safety. It's the same reason that all airlines are doing when they obtain their passengers' info. So, I told the husband that we needed everyone's details and he just said, Sure, no problem. And of course, I was expecting five names on the registration form. By the time that I realized that there were only four names, the family were already at the concierge area to pick up their luggage and then left to go to their rooms. I couldn't go after them as I was assisting another guest. Like I said, it was peak season. So, all I could do was just watch them from afar, walking towards the elevators, and then disappeared from sight. The whole time they were walking, the old woman just followed them from behind quietly, 
but I didn't give much thought to it, and I just went right back to assisting the guest that was in front of me. After the buzz had died down at around 4 p.m., I decided to ring the family's room just to inform them that there were missing details. The husband came down to the reception alone, and I told him that I needed the information of his or his wife's mother's info. This man just stood there. He stared at me for what felt like a minute and said, But it's only my wife and I and our two kids. Me, being confused, obviously said, But sir, I saw that there were five of you. At this point, I thought he was lying to avoid paying for a third person charge for one of the rooms. They got two rooms, and one room is only enough amenities for two persons. Same goes for the buffet breakfast that's included. He took another minute and asked me what did this elderly woman look like, to which I explained that she had gray hair and it was short, like a bob haircut. I also told him that she was wearing this red chongsome shirt and right as I told him that, he quickly took his phone out, frantically scrolled for a few seconds, and then showed me a picture of this same woman the same clothes lying in a closed coffin that had a clear glass cover so you could still look inside. I just nodded slightly and he said that it's his mother. She died unexpectedly a few months ago and I was, to no surprise, too shocked to say anything at this point. But somehow, I managed to mutter the words. I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss, sir, and I am so sorry about this. He just said that it was okay, gave me a small smile, and then left without saying anything. When they checked out two days later, we just pretended like the whole thing never happened. Luckily enough, the elderly woman was not there. And I still get goosebumps just thinking about it, till this day. This happened a few weeks ago, and it was so bizarre that I still think about it every so often. Anyway, I was babysitting my nieces since my sister was going out to meet this other girl at a coffee shop. I offered to babysit them since her house was nice, and I didn't have anything else to do that night. So I decided, why not? At first, we just watched movies and played video games together. Later on into the night, I noticed they didn't need anything and so I asked them if they were hungry. They both replied, no, at first. That's when I said I can make a quesadilla for them or anything else they want. They still replied no. When I mentioned pizza, they immediately yelled yes. Of course they would. Well, bad idea that night. When I called the local pizza hut, I ordered two large pizzas to be delivered. Keep in mind that I went outside to make this phone call. Quite loudly, I should say, because it was dead silent outside. I only went outside because I noticed a bag on the street, and I thought it was mine or somebody else's. It was just trash when I looked closely at it. I'm assuming this was the neighbor's trash bag. Twenty minutes go by, and I hear the doorbell ring. It was the Pizza Hut delivery girl. I paid her in cash, and I took the pizzas to the kitchen where my nieces were eating at. This is when the weird stuff happens. Not even ten minutes go by and I hear the doorbell ring again. I was skeptical at first and looked out the window. It was hard to see much of anything by this point. I opened the door only to be greeted by an old man with a pizza box in his hand. He says to me, Hello son, I got your pizzas that you ordered. I tried to answer in a way that would divert the situation. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't order any pizza. You must have gotten the wrong location. That's when I tried to close the door, but he pushed his hand hard on it and said, Are you sure? I firmly replied back, Yes, and I closed the door. I thought that was the end of that, until one of my nieces told me 
Why is there a man just standing outside our house? I was confused, but my heart started to pound when I thought it was the same old man from earlier. I was right. It was the same old man still standing outside the house with the pizza box still in his hand. I was absolutely livid. I furiously opened the door and yelled at him that I would call the cops immediately. He ran off. My sister arrived two hours later and I told her what happened. She looked immediately concerned and then asked who it was. I told her it was an old man who impersonated a pizza delivery worker. I don't know what she did after I told her. I'm not sure if she called the cops to file a report or not. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. I want to thank my guests for helping narrate these stories. A shout out to Mortis Media, J Nightmares, Papa Scare, Miss Creepy Tales, The Darkest Hour, Danny Dreadful, and Deadly Cure. A special thanks to J Nightmares for sourcing and translating some of these stories. You can find the links to all their channels in the video description if you fancy hearing more of their horror narrations. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind the scenes content. Thank you to Jane Wiggins, Tara Harris, Mary Wright, Callie Townsend, M, Deshaun Edmondson, Kimmy Love, Wendy Maris, Confessions of a Cleaner, Megan Abrams, Miss Tycoon, Stephen Sloan, Christina Myway, Ashley Bray, Madis Afelter, Danielle, Tina Marie Heckman, Amal Garner, Lisa Radford, Deborah Malays, Connie Sue, Taya Adwell, Diana Johnston, Vampy Debs, Jasmine Davis, Erica Asir, Fox Mulder, Ram Beltran, Tina, Nick Bigdoski, Sarah C.H., Neil Kavanaugh, Tiara Sanders, Timothy Stratton, Jennifer Jenkins, Lloyd Rash, Maribel DeLuna, Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Kuro, Amber Hobbs, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Cami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Place 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasps Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyera, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keaton, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Draco, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, 
Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Cow, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. Happy Halloween, everyone.